Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of the program Leading Women right here on Splash 105.5 FM. My name is Titi Lope Oyola. What we do every Wednesday morning at this time is to go into the beautiful world of women, inspiring women, women who have gone ahead of the challenges they're facing to become something inspirational for all women and other members of the society to learn from. I must say that my guest on today's edition of, this, of the program is someone who has personally inspired me when I read her story. Let me read out this quote that I found very fascinating by my guest. Of course, it says, I believe that there is no one that is empty handed and without a gift, skill or talent. Therefore, I will encourage every woman to identify, develop and deploy that gift into its fullest potential, even against all odds. That's a quote by Mrs. Irene Titilola. Olumese. She's my guest on today's edition of the program. Mrs. Irene Titilola Olumese is a nutrition specialist. She's a lung transplant survivor and she is a bilateral amputee. But more than any other thing, she's an author and an inspiration to a whole lot of people. Mrs. Irene Titilola, welcome to Leading Women. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Good to, good to have you as well. So tell us about this you know, experience that almost took your life. How did it happen? Oh, well, <laughs> that's a long, long story. Okay. Um, for 20 years, I lived with a chronic respiratory disease called uh, bronchiectasis and a neuromuscular disease, a debilitating neuromuscular disease called myasthenia gravis. Um, the, we noticed something was wrong in 1990 when I did an x-ray and a shadow was seen in my x-ray. And subsequently, in 1993, I started coughing. And I coughed every day, literally every day, nonstop from then on for the next 20 years. And we soon realized that um, the cough we thought was uh, caused by a cyst in my chest. And I had to have a surgery at the University College Hospital in 1993 to remove a, a, a tumor from between my heart and my lungs. And but the cough didn't stop. Mm. <laughs> Actually, uh, the situation got worse, and that was when I started having the symptoms of the myasthenia gravis, which is uh, a neuromuscular disease that results in a weakness of the muscles. And for me, it was more uh, prominent in the upper muscles. My eyelids just dropped, and um, I felt, you know, the weakening of the upper muscles. It became difficult for me even to comb my hair. Um, by 1998. Um, the situation had really gotten really bad, and I, I had a diagnosis here at the University College of Spickle. The doctors told me what they thought it was, um, and it was very scary. So I had to go uh, to U.S. to get a second opinion, and they confirmed exactly what the doctors at UCH told before me. Before then, before yeah. you found out about the diagnosis, had you heard about it before, or that was your first contact with such a thing? No, I've never had anything like that before. I mean, I had uh, 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 asthma like symptoms, um, an adult onset around about 16, 18, but nothing like that before. Never heard of that before. So how did your parents deal with that part, you know, having to deal with the diagnosis when you found out at that time? It was a challenge to everybody. I mean, my, I, had, I was married uh, by the time we had the full diagnosis. Um, breaking the news to both our parents was difficult. Um, but thank God we have very strong uh, Christian parents who were praying along with us. Both my husband's parents and my parents were praying all along with us uh, as we went through the, co <laughs> the, the whole thing. You said thing. you were, <laughs> let's backtrack a little <laughs> more. You said that you were married at the time that um, you found out about the diagnosis. Yeah. Did your husband get any wind of it before, maybe while you were dating or something, or he was fully aware and he went ahead to marry you? Um, I think at the time when I heard the first indication um, uh, in 1990, we were already engaged. Um, I was doing my uh, medical checkup for my Canadian visa. Okay. I was going to, uh, to Canada to do a part of my doctorate degree. At that time, I was doing my PhD program in, uh, at the University College Hospital. Yeah. So we saw that, but it didn't, um, it didn't worry us because we didn't know exactly what it was. We just saw the shadow that needed to be investigated. But um, since I got my medical clearance, it was all okay. But it was a year, barely a year after we got married, that um, the whole thing became full-blown. 
Mm. Mm. So how did he deal with it? Being your just you were obviously a new couple at that time. Yeah. Was it challenging? How was it? Well, how did he react? My husband is a medical doctor. He trained as a pediatrician, and you know, doctors can wear a mask. And so when I first brought in, I remember when I did the X ray in 1993, that um, it really gave an indication that something was happening. And I brought it home. I mean, you could see it quickly wore the uh, the doctor's mask and um, told me, "Don't worry, this is um, with this needs further investigation. They can't make this uh, conclusion yet." But as time went on, it became clear that we had a big issue. And my husband had been very, has been very, very, very supportive. I don't think I'll still be alive today if I was married to somebody else. Because, I mean, he literally carried me, cared for me, not cheated me through everything. Mm. Do you think that was because he is a medical doctor or that's just his person? I just think that's lucky. just his person. I'm just blessed. I wouldn't even dare to call it luck. It's just simply a blessing, a gift from God. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a miracle to mm. have that. So at yeah. the point where you discovered that he was going to be you know, full-blown and everything, did it change anything about you? I knew you worked with the United Nations. You worked for yes. uh, f a few years, about 15 years, before yes. you eventually stopped that work. Did it, uh, that condition, how did it shape your career decisions? Uh, well, I didn't, um, I'm thank God for the disgrace, I didn't allow my medical my health situation to affect my life. I mean, in the course of it, I had my two sons. In the course of it, I mean, I, I worked in Ibadan first uh, until 1999 and moved. I was transferred to Lagos. I continued to work. And then I was transferred to Ghana. Um, it was challenging in the sense that um, it required a lot more from me, especially when you're coughing so much and it hurts in the chest. But I made up my mind that I was not going to let my health get in the way of the things that I needed to do. So I managed my health as best as I could and I continued to do what I needed to do. Um, I had the diagnosis, I had the medications that I needed to use, to use. I was told what to do, what not to do, and I simply was not going to let my health get in the way. And I, I was able to do that. And, but when I got to Ghana, I had a relapse. And my lungs just collapsed um, in the middle of preparing for a conference. And I was working in the northern part of Ghana in Tamale, where I couldn't even be flown to Accra. I had to go in, a, in an ambulance without oxygen, when without um, air conditioner, 11 hours by route to Accra. And I arrived there, you know, <laughs> with the last breath. And I, I was able to, my, God, God kept me. And um, after spending about six weeks in the hospital, realized that he couldn't deal with the situation and had to be medically evacuated. It was at this time I was evacuated to Geneva in Switzerland. At this time, my husband was already working in Switzerland, so it just made sense for me, you know, to go. At this time, I realized that the stress of my work, the intensity of the work that I was doing was really hampering my health. Mm. Um, so I took a decision to stop work in 2003 for a little while, first to integrate my children in to the system there and also to give myself uh, a, a, a breathing space to deal with my health issues. In the course of it, you had your two sons. Yes. How did you go about that you know, process? For uh, a woman who doesn't have any health condition, childbirth can be very, you know, <laughs> tedious. How did you do it? Is it because you had information or because you're married to a medical doctor? Did that sort of help you in the process? Yeah, I had information. First, I had lost my first pregnancy. Okay. Um, in 1993, okay. um, I had a stillbirth, and so we were, we were cautious of the fact that I needed to pay particular attention. And I had very good um, uh, uh, medical support from my uh, d my doctors in UCH. My doctor then, Professor Jengbede, you know, had his eye on me uh, when I was expecting my sec you know my second pregnancy, but my first, my, son. My first son. Yes, so I had his eye on me and. Um, um, when we started looking as if things were you know, going the way we wanted, immediately got me into the theater and brought the baby out. And it was a good decision. It was a timely decision that they did because that way they were able to save my, you know, my baby so, you know, so, so that I wouldn't have lost the second child. So I had um, my first son in 1994. 
and then um, I had my second one in 1997. This time I was also managed by a very good um, obstetrician in UCH, and um, they were monitoring me closely, and uh, they had made this decision that they were not going to let me exceed 38 weeks, so I had an elective caesarean section, and the baby was brought out. And, uh, yeah. you, you talk about University College Hospital. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that, you know, at the time you were having your children, uh, the, the kind of care and attention you got, do you think if you had remained in Nigeria up until this point, before you finally moved to Geneva, do you think you would have gotten the same medical, you know, attention? How do you think you would have been able to manage this condition? Do you think it would have been the same thing compared to living abroad? Um, the, the condition, you know, by the time it was 2006, I became oxygen dependent, which meant that I needed to have an, a supplemental source of oxygen 24 hours a day. It would have been a challenge here, you know, to be able to manage that at home. I mean, I could go to work. I went to work in Cairo when I became, excuse me, oxygen dependent. Um, getting oxygen bottle into the office and carrying an oxygen uh, concentrator required 24 hours electricity. I mean, the challenges in the country would have made that very difficult. I mean, that I have to have a constant supply of oxygen at home, and when I don't have the the oxygen in bottle, my um, oxygen concentrator has to be able to function with electricity being available 24 hours a day. Hmm. I did come to Nigeria twice with all my uh, packages. I mean, it it required a lot of arrangement to be sure that there was oxygen in the house, so we arranged for for oxygen to be brought to me from the hospital into the house, and I had my mobile. And it meant that when there was no electricity, we needed to run the generator 24 hours of the day. It would have been challenging if I was walking and living in a in, you know, at certain time I had stopped walking mm. and my family had had to depend on one you know source of income, my husband. Mm. It would have been difficult for us to be able to sustain that provision of oxygen because as at that time there were no health insurance. I mean, even when we, you know where we are living, we couldn't even maintain, uh, accomplish that with our own income. It required health insurance. So. At the, in a place where there is no health insurance, where the electricity is not constant, if I had been here, I don't think we would be telling the same story as we are telling today. Hmm. Yeah. Now, how did you, <laughs> all this you have just described, when I read your story, I found it very insp- inspiring, and I'm sure a lot of people who have come in, uh, in contact with it would have felt the same. Yeah. How do you cope with your daily life, having to deal with that condition at the point you were coughing every day and you weren't even sure when it was going to stop or if it was going to stop? What kept you going? What made you strong? I think the only thing that kept me going was my faith and trust in God. I just knew that I ha- God has a purpose for my life and I wasn't going anywhere until I accomplished that purpose. So it, it took that faith and trust in God control over my life to face each day because by 2007 I was homebound I could no longer leave the house if I have to leave the house I had a measured period because my oxygen bottle would only last for a few hours Mm. so I can only go out for the length of time that my oxygen bottle would require and then uh, in 2010, I was placed on waiting list, my doctors told me that my lungs could no longer sustain my life and that I have to change the lungs. I mean, you don't go to the market to go and buy a new set of lungs. No, so I had don't. to be on the waiting list for to find a donor that would give me a, a, a pair of lungs for a lung transplant. I couldn't even have heard a lung transplant in Nigeria. Do you ever question God? Did you ever ask why this was going? Well, why this was happening to you? No. And I, the reason why is that I think um, in my relationship with God, right from the onset, I know God doesn't do mistakes and it doesn't do happenstances. And if nothing ca- catches God unawares, if this was happening to me, there had to be a reason for it. Yes, I wanted to know why, why, where was this leading? But where will faith be? What will be the purpose of faith if you can see ahead? Right? So it was... Um, I didn't have an answer to where this was leading at that time. But now I can look back and say it's been well worth the journey. Look at where God has brought me in spite of everything that I had been through. I mean, I had a lung transplant in 2013. Um, 
after waiting for three years before they could find a donor that matched me, and I you know, was up on the waiting list. But when I had that transplant, within 24 hours, I started having post-surgical complications, and I had to be put into coma because my systems were shutting down. And so you were in coma for, for about four weeks? I was in coma for four weeks. Four weeks. When you woke up, what changed? Yeah, when I woke up, uh, my husband and my doctors, they came to me and said, um, you had very strong lungs, the surgery went very well, but you have been asleep for four weeks. <laughs> and because, I mean, I was very confused because while I was in coma, I had all sorts of things happening. Mm -hmm. I was seeing so many things that mm -hmm. it was a lot of struggling. And so I was very confused when I woke up from the coma and really, really confused. I had no idea where I was. And then when they told me that I had been asleep, the Unfortunately, while I was uh, in coma, the complications got worse. I had poor blood circulation to my extremities, that means to my legs, to my feet, and to my hands. We're going to talk about our part <laughs> after this break. You're always leading women on Splash 105.5 FM. I am Titi Lokbe Oyola, and my leading woman for today is an author, an inspirational speaker. She's, an, she's a human nutrition specialist, and she is a strong woman. Welcome back. You're still on to Leading Women on Splash 105.5 FM. I'm Titi Lokwe Oyola, and my guest is Mrs. Irene Titi Lola Olumese. Before we went on that break, you were talking about how um, the effect of the surgery affected you and some part of your body. Tell us more. Okay. So um, they told me that um, I had poor bl uh, blood circulation to my, uh, um, ex uh, my hands and to my legs. And as a result of that, necrosis had occurred. Necrosis meant that the tissue died and uh, that the only solution way out of that is to have b that both my legs amputated and my hands amputated. Okay, that was massive. Um, I remember when they told me, I was stunned. I mean, I didn't even know how to respond. I think what just came to me was that how much more can one person take after 20 years of coughing every day, nonstop, and then they tell me now that I have brand new lungs and they're strong and no legs, no arms. Oh, God, just take me home. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, was, it was massive. But, you know, God gave us this word of comfort that he would give me the feet of grace hmm. that would take me to a place, the places my natural feet would not take me. And it was very, I didn't make any sense out of that word, but um, um, we knew I knew that um, there's no way I could keep the lungs if I want to keep the legs. I mean, the necrosis was riding up and it would poison my blood and it would poison, uh, it, uh, you know, I couldn't just continue to live with that. So we submitted to it and um, my two legs were amputated below the knees that at was the when? end of May 2013. Okay. But my hands recovered and praise God today I learned to write again. I learned to do things with my hands again. And now I can even beat with my hands. I mean, I'm doing beating and I wrote the book. Um, the hands yes, your book, recovered, yeah. your, your, your book, Grace in the Storm, yeah. which is one of the reasons why you're in Nigeria. Yes. You know, tell us, when did you, um, at what point did you gather the courage to start writing and start talking about your situation? Because this means something that you have to deal with on a daily basis. Yes. How did you, when did you get to that point where you wanted to put your story out and you wanted to be an inspiration to other women or Interest other people? Interestingly, I knew right from the beginning that nothing that I was going through was just about me. That was the word of comfort I had had right from 19, 1984, that everything that I was going through was just not about me. There was somebody else at the end of the road that was going to benefit from what I, I go through. And I think that was one of the things that had kept me was that verse from the um, Second Corinthians chapter 1, that I will comfort you in all your afflictions with the same comfort with which you will comfort others. I have held on to that word, doing that. Every hard thing that I go through, I'm going to get comfort from the from the Lord that I will pass on to someone else. So I think it was in 2003, um, uh, while I was in Ghana, 2002, 2003, there about, while I was in Ghana, that my pastor said to me that, Erin, you have a story to tell. Because she had heard of what I had gone through leading to that period. 
and that you know made it make a mental note that you have a story to tell. Then in two thousand and four, somebody just had a bit of what I had gone through. Said you need to write a book about this. Then two thousand and four, I was wondering what exactly was I going to write. Um, <laughs> there's no resolution yet. So I, that was when I started journaling and started writing down, and um, it became very strong in my heart that I had to write the book. So I started writing in two thousand and five actually, but. I didn't know what to do with the story. There wasn't a conclusion. I wanted a conclusion. I didn't just want to write about all the small victories along, well, mm-hmm. big victories along the way. <laughs> but I wanted a conclusion to it. So after the tra- lung transplant, I survived the lung transplant, and I survived the amputation. I knew that was time to finish this book. And it wasn't no longer going in the direction that I wanted before. That now I can talk about the grace that we get even when we're going through storms. And storms is what every one of us will go through at one time or the other in our lives. And we have to decide what do we make out of those the storms of life that we go through. That we can actually ask this grace that will give us the strength to go through the storms. And what we go through can be a benefit to somebody else in the future. And now I use my story to inspire others that no matter how fierce our storms may be, no matter how challenging the difficulties in life we face, we can come out of it strong if we hold on to the hands of the Lord and keep our eyes fixed on the goal that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't have to give up. I will not give up on hope, but I will hold on to hope of coming out of this. And that hope is simply anchored. So you're going to be God. at an event on Saturday. Yes. On Tell s- us a bit about it. On Saturday, I will be sharing my story at uh, Global Harvest Church. I will be sharing my story of uh, how grace has kept me through all the storms of life, which I've just shared in a little bit of it, and also present my book, Grace in the Storms, to everyone who will be coming. The purpose of sharing the story is simply to inspire others who may be going through life challenges and adversities. So when when um, looking at all of this, when you before you got your diagnosis, mm. what are those things that you wanted to do that you felt you looked up, you looked forward to doing, mm. and you feel that are, they, are, are, are you able to do them now, given your you know, health condition or? Everything you're doing now is still in tandem with what you've always wanted to do. Everything I'm doing now is still in tandem. It's in a different way. All I've wanted to do is to be able to, you know, affect people's life. All I've always wanted to do is to be able to challenge people. I mean, when I was working professionally as a nutrition specialist with UNICEF, I was promoting exclusive breastfeeding. I was known to use my experience to challenge women that you can give your child exclusive breastfeeding in spite of every, all the challenges a professional woman can breastfeed. So I have always wanted to affect people's life and make a change and make a difference. I'm not talking about breastfeeding as much as I used to do now. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about living life and staying strong and holding up to hope in spite of the life's challenges. The skills that I use then, I'm applying it differently now. It's still the same communication skills. It's still the ability to advocate. It's the ability to encourage people to change their concepts, to change their perception. So I'm living my life um, fulfilling my dreams in a different way. Uh, the foundation is helping me also to f- touch lives for good. That's the we Feet of Grace The Feet foundation. of Grace Foundation raises funds now to support amputees living in poor communities in developing countries. Nigeria is our base. I go about encouraging people to support others who cannot do, who, who require support. Amputees don't need pity. I'm a bilateral amputee. I, I do everything I need to do. Yes, with support, but I don't need anybody's pity. I need the institutions to provide me access, ease of access to enter any building that I want to enter. If I want to go to the toilet in any building, I need to be sure that things are there that will make it easy for me to go to the bathroom. And that's what I advocate for. Government institutions, private institutions. Now, should speaking be, of that, you yeah. have a foundation, your Feet of Grace found foundation, where you raise funds for amputees yes. in mostly developing countries. Yeah. How has it been? What, what has been the response, the success rate? Looking at the fact that it's an it's a non-governmental organization, yeah. you probably don't have, you know, support of the government. 
Do you? That's why it's non-governmental. Yes. It means that we reach out to private people mm. to support. I want to touch your heart for you to be willing to support people who are less privileged. Mm. You are blessed with two legs, two arms. And you have people around you who don't. What can you do to help them? That's what I, I share my story for you to do. And today, we have done uh, uh, over 12 amputees already. In the first year, we did three amputees. Last year, we did six. This year, already, we've completed two. Our target is to raise funds for 10 amputees this year. Six has already been initiated, two completed, and... Uh, we, we were going by the end of this week we should pay for the seventh one and i'm so persuaded that there are a lot of good-hearted people who are willing in spite of their own situations to stretch out their hands to others and lift them up it, the response has been beyond my wildest imagination both in nigeria and internationally hmm. I'm, I'm just i mean i'm just amazed at the response that we have received so far you're on to leading women right here on Splash 105.5 FM. I have been having this conversation, inspiring conversation with Mrs. Irene Sitilola Olumesa. She is the author of Grace in the Storms, a nutrition specialist. She is a long transplant survivor and a bilateral amputee. She's very passionate about sharing her story to the world. She believes that there is no one that is empty-handed without a gift, a skill, or a talent. She believes that you should, as a woman or wherever you are, identify and develop those gifts to the fullest, regardless of the odds. Welcome back. You're still on to the program Leading Women right here on Splash FM. Now, before we went on that break, we talked about how um, your book and how you've been able to advocate for a lot of people uh, who are living with um, amputee situations. Now, let's talk about how you unwind. <laughs> I know you don't walk all the time. You don't advocate all the time. What do you do that makes you, you know, happy? Uh, I, I lead a one-woman choir. <laughs> I love singing. And okay. so, I mean, I, I sing a lot, and I love entertaining, um, hosting uh, uh, hosting guests. Like, I love cooking. Um, so I do a lot of cooking. I entertain guests in my home. I um, have... I don't think there's any one month the first we have us having an international guest in our home in Geneva, somebody from Nigeria, from other countries mm -hmm. visiting um, for one conference or the other in the country that passes through our home. So that keeps me fully engaged. I do uh, beat jewelry. I, I, um, the beat jewelry is called Hands of Grace Creations. I, cre I may create things with the hands that um, the doctors thought will be amputated. Mm -hmm. I create this... Um, Little jewelry, and we also use that to raise funds for the foundation. Mm. So, do, do you like fashion? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I like to be well dressed. I believe in moderation. Uh, I think I have I have the eyes for colors. I like putting fabrics together. Um, I really I like creating things. So my tailors do get a lot of work to do. <laughs> How would you describe yourself? I know you're first of seven children. Yes, I am. Uh, Who is Mrs. Irene Zilola Ulumisi? I think that she is a woman after God's heart. She's a woman who wants to fulfill God's purpose for her life. And she's a woman who believes that nothing happens to her by chance because she's loved by a God who created her for a unique, a only she can fulfill the purpose. I'm here on earth in this world to make an impact. And I want the impact, you know, the impact of my presence in this world to continue to resonate long after I have gone. I want to arrive in heaven and hear, well done, thou faithful servant. That's who I am. That's what I'm all about. I'm passionate about pursuing purpose. I want to use every gift that God deposited in me and die zero. Empty. Empty. Did this conviction come because of the way you were brought up? Or where did you pick it up? At what point did you get this uh, sort of belief system that you hold? Um, I was brought up first and foremost in a Methodist home. My father was bishop of the Methodist church. My mother was a teacher. I had very st strict upbringing, but I think I came to a turning point when I 
had you know got into a personal relationship with God myself it wasn't as a religion or that my father had taught me or my mother had shown me but me having a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with God and that was in 1984 and that was the turning point in my life and after that everything else had been adding on um, I've always been a strong world person. I mean, I mean, when I set my mind on doing something, I pursue it. Some people call it stubborn. I call it determined. Um, I've been called uh, stubborn. I've been called aggressive, uh, but I call it assertive. I call it determined. I just simply believe that each of us here can make a difference in a little space that God has given us. And if each one of us go out to make a difference in our own little space, we can create a critical mass of so many of us making a difference. If it is just about me, 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 it's selfish. That doesn't make any difference. But if my life can touch another life for good, then I would have made a difference. I would have been able to make an impact. And that impact will outlive me. But things that I do just for myself, when it's all about me, it's, it ends with me. And I don't want to just pass through my world without leaving, making a difference without living. Are you impact. always like this? Are you always this optimistic? I am. <laughs> I believe so. Every time. I have had my, of course, with everything that I have gone through, I, would, it would, it, I wouldn't be sincere if I had not said I have had my struggles. Yeah, I have wept tears. I have wept, I have had nights of crying and weeping and crying to the Lord. Take this pain away. If it is possible, just take this cup away from me. I mean, living with a chronic disease, I'm talking of 20 long years of living in pain, in distress. That is difficult. It's not easy. And there have been moments that, I mean, I have wept and wept and wept before God. But why now? Why this face in my life? But I've, in all the midst of, in the midst of all of that, received comfort. I have, in all, in the midst of that, received comfort. I didn't have answers. Those times when you feel that way, what do you do to come out of it? I start singing. Um, if I can't sing, then it's, I mean, let me give you an example. I went to the hospital one day um, while I was preparing for my trans, the lung transplant. And the professor who saw me was so, I mean, presented the situation in such a hopeless way. He said I would bleed to death on the table that my, my, the constellation of risks make it a challenge for them to guarantee my surviving the transplant. I mean, I went from my house from the hospital to my house, 60 kilometers away. I was, it was, a, it was, he presented to me a hopeless situation. And I told my husband, I said, I'm not coming out of my bedroom until I can pray, until I can sing and praise God. So just leave me in this bedroom, put on, then it was CD that, you know, you have the CD man, we had a CD player, hmm. said, just put something there. And he put Don Moore in there. And I was singing, I was singing, you know, even though the future may look like, and I don't understand, but yet I will sing. In my darkest hour, I will sing. I listen to it over and over and over again until in my lowest point, in my darkest hour, I could sing. I was after I could sing that I left the room. So that's where how I, I was able to go through all of that. You, you just have to have an anchor for your faith. You need to have something, a word that you can hold on to. And I dare say that God never leaves us alone in any situation where we are. We just need to be conscious of his presence and be willing to listen to what word he has to give to us to take us through. Because nothing that we go through is purposeless. Now, let's talk about your sons. Yes. At the point where you, where you were you know, giving birth and training them, you had to also deal with this yeah. condition. Yeah. Did you feel that you weren't uh, able to perform your duties as a mother enough as a result of that or nothing changed? Yeah, there were those times when I felt like that. There were those times, I mean, when I had to be in US for almost six months, I left my children here um, all because I was trying to deal with my health. And there were times even when we moved to Switzerland that I couldn't be with them to at their school events because I need to carry my oxygen tank with me and I thought that I would be an embarrassment to them. I couldn't go for the teacher, you know, teacher parents conference. And my children kept saying that they want me to come. They want me to be at their basketball games. They want me to be at their school events. And I thought that I would be an embarrassment to them, but they told me, no, mama, we want you to be there. 
they, 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 they supported me. My, my first son was 14 years old, where he said to me, Mama, lean on me. I mean, I needed to walk up the staircase. I was exhausted. I could hardly breathe. It was just us at home because my husband's job was travel intensive. So if he's not around, the responsibility fell on my son to take care of me. And he said, Mommy, lean on me. So, I mean, I felt that what was I, I mean, what was I taking these children through? So it wasn't just about me. The story, the testimony is about my children surviving it. My son graduated last, uh, in May as an electric engineer. In spite of all the challenges, my second son is in a, in a, has just completed his second year as an engineer, an you know, uh, 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 engineer student. They went through those tough times with me. They and their father, and they matured through the process. They became independent through the process. My first son cooked his first pot of stew at 14. How, why do you think they were like that? It turned out like that. Most of the time, when we talk about parenting, even parents who are always there and always keeping an eye, sometimes you find out that children turn out the other way. What do you think stood your sons out? Was it because uh, of the kind of teachings you gave them, or they just turned out to be like that by chance? No, I don't think it's by chance. I think our children, the observers, they observe the way you deal with difficult situations and it forms them. You know, there are a lot more that we teach our children in the way we respond and react in situations than what we actually say to them. And I believe that my children also grew through the process. They watch how we were dealing with challenges. They watch how we don't just give up when things got hard. They saw a mother struggling to keep, maintain sanity, maintain normalcy in the home, despite the fact of all that we were going through. All those things, I believe that it left an impression on them and God allowed it to take roots in their heart. They saw how we faced all the difficult situation by faith in God. I believe all that made a difference. I mean, it's not as if we didn't have a difficult moment. Of course, you try raising a teenager and when they want to do what they want to do and you say no. Of course, they will revolt and you say, look, I believe that I, I believe that in the Nigeria we have a culture of respect. I believe that we have a culture that we should maintain and we, in the way we raise our children. It's a community that raises the children. My mother told me only one woman gives birth to a child but a community raised that child. So I had a community around me and I allowed my children to know that it's all a community raising the children, their aunties, their uncles, very close friends who were there to support us also impacted my children's life. My husband played a, 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 a critical role by being a role model for them. All this added up, but the most important part is we make it a responsibility to pray for each one of our children individually on a daily basis. Okay, so your final word for someone who is listening to you, perhaps going through some challenges in their lives and they feel, oh, what am I going to do with your life? Let me say this, um, don't give up on hope. You see, things happen, we go through storms. And for as many as on the precipice of despair, who can feel very hopeless, I would encourage you to hold fast to hope as if your life depends on it. And I have to say this also, that everything that we go through in life, there is a purpose for it. And we may not see it now, but it will unfold if we hold fast to hope that God will come through for us. That is what has worked for me. I have faced dear, dear, dear challenging situations in life. But I made a choice. You have to choose that you're not going to go down with it. I have a choice. I could have sunk into despair and depression when my two legs were amputated. But I chose that I want to ride above the storm. And grace will give us the wind to rise above the storm. And that is my word to everyone listening to me. Never give up on hope. Don't go down the slope of, of despair. I don't do self-pity. I don't do, go to anybody's pity party. Pity is not going to do you anything. So don't let anybody pity you and don't open yourself to pity. 
Don't make yourself a victim. I choose that I'm not going to be a victim. I'm going to be I a victim. I think our listeners will have to come for your book reading yeah. and hear um, the full version of your story on Saturday. Tell us more again. And Saturday, 22nd of July, this Saturday at 11 o'clock a.m., it starts and it's taking place at Global, Global Harvest Church and Harvesters Road of Jericho, uh, Liberty Road, yeah? Liberty Road on uh, Ring Road. Uh, that's where it's going to take place. So and it's going to be a book signing. It will be book signing, book reading, and a sharing of my testimony. And it's being hosted by Tululope Aladisomi. I must thank you very much for sparing the time to uh, speak with me on the program Leading Women for today. I have been speaking with Mrs. Irene Titilola Olumese, a nutrition specialist, uh, an inspirational speaker, an author, and a strong woman. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And that's it on today's edition of the program, Leading Women, right here on Splash 105.5 FM. For comments and observation, you can send a text or call 0805-699-8705. That's 0805-699-8705. Zero five. I want to appreciate my sound engineer, Olua Folajimi Adeyefa, and my producer, Ronke Giwa Onofua. I'm Titi Lope Oyola, and I'm going to leave you with this song titled Conqueror by Estelle. Until we see you again next week, I'm Titi Lope Oyola. Don't forget, every woman matters. Mm-hmm.